So um, we're going to get started. My name is Sarah Bostic, and I am the Sustainable Agriculture Extension Agent with the University of Florida in Sarasota County. And this is uh, the 18th class in our edible gardening series, and we're pretty excited to be here with you today. Um, and I am joined today with two of my wonderful coworkers, Carol Wyatt Evans, who is the Chemicals and the Environment Agent, and Mindy Hannock, who is the Community and School Garden Coordinator for Sarasota County. And she is the one who's gonna be moderating the chat box today. So if you have questions, because um, we are expecting a very large group, we actually sold out um, with 300 registrants today. Um, so we're gonna ask folks to just keep their microphones muted for so everyone can have a good sound quality and type those questions right in the chat box and Mindy will keep them organized. So here we go. Well, except my screen doesn't wanna change. Uh, so today's topic is herbs for Florida. And this is, this is a topic we get a lot of requests for, for assistance with. And we actually started this, this series because we get so many calls in our office um, and, and it's true across so much of Florida from folks that have recently moved here and are figuring out that they are really struggling to garden or folks that are maybe from Florida and have just started gardening for the first time and can't figure out why certain things aren't working. So that's really why we started this series and we've been having a really, really fun time with it and have gotten some great feedback from all of y'all. So um, we've decided to actually extend it to 25 sessions. Um, so we'll, we'll send out some info on how to register for the last five classes in the series shortly. Uh, so herbs, this is one of my favorite topics. I, I love growing things. Um, I particularly love growing herbs. And many of you who have been with our series for a while know that I actually um, moved to Florida from a much more Northern place about five years ago and had to really, really figure out how to grow things in a very different way. Um, so herbs were definitely on that list of things that I had to figure out um, and have had such a great time doing it. So there's many, um, many of the familiar herbs and spices um, that we find in the grocery store actually grow quite well in Florida. There's a handful that don't, um, but then there's also all sorts of things that we don't often think about incorporating into our cooking um, that grow really well in Florida and can be a wonderful way to really expand um, your, your diet and your culinary palate um, can be pretty fun. So, this week just so happens to be the beginning of Eat Local Week in Sarasota and Manatee Counties down here where we are located. And in my opinion, what better way to eat local than to actually grow some of your own herbs? You know, that's such a great way to add a little bit of local into your own diet. So um, for all of you who are joining um, us today as an Eat Local Week event, um, welcome. And we hope that you like our series enough that you want to come back for more classes. So this is a this is a list, it's not a comprehensive list, but these are some of the familiar herbs that grow really well in Florida. Um, and there's some caveats to this and I'll, and I'll get into that in just a second. But there's you know, things like basil. Basil tends to be people's, um, the, the, the number one herb that people want to grow. And um, with basil, one of, the, one of the keys with basil is that we, we are really susceptible down here to um, a fungus called downy mildew. But there happens to be quite a few varieties on the market now that you can purchase seeds or seedlings of that are downy mildew resistant. Um, that really is the key to growing basil in Florida. Totally possible to grow basil in Florida. Um, downy mildew resistant variety is going to go a very long way in helping that. So other things that grow um, quite well in, in all or most of Florida are things like cilantro, dill, mint, parsley, Rosemary um, tends to do much better in the northern half of Florida, not so well in the southern half of Florida. Uh, sage, like a culinary sage, actually grows pretty well, grown as an annual um, across most of the state. Um, thyme, thyme generally also as an annual, um, which is different than most of the rest of the country where it can grow as a perennial. Um, chives are another that actually grow quite well in the northern half of Florida and not as well in the southern half, but it's well worth a try. And then I added a couple of things to this list that a lot of folks don't really think of as, um, as herbs, uh, but they, they're really flavorful in the way that herbs are. Um, so scallions and celery, those are two of actually really easy things to grow in Florida and are a great way to add some flavor um, from your backyard into the things you cook in your home. So what doesn't grow particularly well in Florida? So any of those herbs that we just went through on the grows well list 
if you grow them at the wrong time of year in Florida. We find that most of the issues that people have with growing herbs in Florida is simply that they are planting them at the wrong time of year. Um, in, in general, most of the herbs that we, that we like to eat in our um, pretty standard American diets come from really dry parts of the world. Um, the and our summers um, are anything but dry. They are extremely hot, extremely humid. You do not how to na navigate Oops, this. We've got someone unmuted. Um, they are extreme. We have a lot of rain and um, just so humid. And so that's the part of the year where herbs actually don't, the, stand, the standard um, typical American diet of herbs don't tend to grow nearly, um, nearly as well as they do in the rest of the country. And, and in general, just don't, don't thrive at all. So the, the grows well list grown at the wrong time of year doesn't grow um, in Florida. And then, and so for most of most of Florida, what we're talking about is the standard list of herbs don't really grow well between May and September-ish, somewhere in there, depending on where you are um, in Florida. So this is, a, this is a funny little list of four herbs that I, um, I get a surprising number of calls about um, as the agriculture agent down here. People are trying to figure out if some of the things they used to grow in a more northern garden will grow well down here. So the, these are a list of things that don't grow particularly well in Florida. Um, garlic, um, garlic has a lot of, a lot of nuances to it. Um, and this is um, probably the number one thing that falls kind of into that herb category that I actually receive calls about. So I wrote this week's blog post about um, all of the do's and don'ts and ins and outs and little tips and tricks to growing garlic successfully in Florida. So I'll have that blog post out um, within the next day or two so you can learn a lot more. Um, lavender. So the, the picture that you can see on your screen, um, that is actually a variety of lavender. A lot of folks that have grown lavender in more northern places wouldn't recognize this as lavender, but this is a Spanish variety of lavender that actually does moderately well um, in northern Florida or the north half of Florida, not super well in the southern half of Florida. Um, but you can kind of baby it along. So if you are trying to grow lavender, make sure you're finding a, a Spanish variety. And then lovage and rhubarb. Those are two, um, two perennials that are really commonly grown in, in gardens in the far north and in Canada um, that just really don't grow down here because they require a very long period of time of being frozen solid in the ground that we just don't have. So those are some of the standard things and some of the things that I tend to get a lot of calls about. But what I really wanna talk about today are a lot of the herbs and spices and other flavorful things that we don't tend to think of as our standards in our, in our general American diet. But they're things that grow really, really well in other parts of the world that have a climate much more similar to what we actually have right here in Florida, which means that they're much easier to grow than standard American herbs. So we're gonna dive right in. Um, this is one of my favorite. I think it is so beautiful and it has such an incredibly unique flavor. It's called galangal root. Um, and if you've ever had a Thai curry, you've probably had it before. It's a, it's a really distinct flavor that's hard to describe. Um, I think it's absolutely delicious and it grows much like turmeric does. Um, basically the exact same growing conditions um, as turmeric. Um, you've probably seen ornamental ginger and ornamental turmeric and things like that growing in landscapes. Um, it actually it grows also, the culinary varieties grow very, very well all across Florida. And it's one of those wonderful things that actually grow really well in shade, which is pretty amazing. There's very few, very few edible things that want to be grown in full shade. Um, the, the turmeric and um, the turmeric and ginger and galangal actually do quite well in, in shade. They have very few pest and disease issues here. Um, and turmeric, you can eat either fresh um, or you can dry it, powder it, eat it that way. Um, ginger, like the ginger root you get in the store, um, same thing, it's grown the same way as turmeric. And it's just beautiful. Um, it's a really wonderful plant to just keep, keep growing and harvesting little bits and then you just keep growing it and growing it. Um, ginger actually will also do, do just fine in full sun, although it does prefer some shade. Uh, culantro, that is not a typo on my screen. Culantro um, is the plant that you can see right there on your screen. I actually took this picture um, in a planter box on my back deck. 
Um, I absolutely love culantro. The first time I ever came in contact with it, um, knowingly at least, um, was about 20 years ago when I was in a very rural village in Honduras and there was clearly some cilantro in my soup um, by flavor, but there was nothing that looked like cilantro in my soup. So I inquired and discovered it was this funny looking little sharp, um, short plant um, called culantro. Um, it's a really, um, it's a really resilient alternative to cilantro. It's totally unrelated to cilantro. And for a lot of people um, actually have a, um, the, their genetic makeup makes them actually taste soap when they eat cilantro. There's something, there's an enzyme in, um, in cilantro that translate for, translates for some people into the flavor of soap. Culantro does not have that enzyme. So you won't taste the soap flavor, just the just the cilantro flavor that all of us who don't taste that soap flavor with regular cilantro taste. Um, it can thrive in full sun, significant shade, um, drought, wet, um, wind, um, salt water. It's, it's an incredibly robust, resilient plant and it has very few pest and disease issues and it will live actually quite a long time. Um, you can start it from seed or buy some plants. Um, and one leaf is so pungent that it goes a really long way. African blue basil um, is another one. It, this is a really, this is actually a really neat plant. This was an accidental hybrid um, between a couple of different varieties of, of basil um, that, that naturally, naturally hybridized. Um, and, um, and, and the resulting um, African blue basil, as it's usually called, um, actually does not, does not produce um, viable seed which means that all of it has to be propagated or reproduced by cuttings, um, which means that it can be a little bit hard to find. You can't buy a package of seeds for it. You have to actually buy the plant and somebody started it by snipping it and um, convincing it to make some roots and putting it in soil. So it can grow when it's really happy, it can grow as large as a three by three foot shrub. Um, it's a pretty impressive plant and um, Pollinators love it. Um, it is um, actually a perennial variety of basil. It's much more resistant to a lot of the, the molds and mildews and bacterial issues that basils down here have. And it can survive um, a truly amazing amount of heat, humidity, um, excess rain, as well as drought. And um, it is a little bit different in flavor though. So it's something, you know, just go into it knowing that it's not, not your standard basil flavor, um, but it is um, an incredibly resilient beautiful plant. And then Thai basil. Um, and again, if you've had a Thai curry um, or spring rolls, things like that, you likely have had Thai basil. It has a little bit of a licorice flavor to it. Um, it definitely holds up better to disease than a lot of the Italian type um, basils that we're more used to seeing. And just like the African blue basil, it survives um, big big dramatic weather much, much more um, successfully than a lot of the Italian types of basil. But it does flower really, really fast. So you actually have to keep up with harvesting it. Um, and if you, if you like it, um, that's not a problem. Um, and if, you, if you're finding that you don't love your, your Thai basil, if you give it a try, um, one of the things that it's also used for is cut flowers. It's a really great, great filler. Um, so as your, your basil is flowering, you can just cut it and make little bouquets with it. So that's another great little side benefit to Thai basil. It's lovely. Lemongrass um, is another incredibly robust, really easy Florida, Florida herb that you can grow. Um, it's an, you know, adds amazing flavor to all sorts of dishes. It grow, it's very large. Um, it's very, very tough. Um, you can even take a weed whacker to it if it's getting out of control for you. It's that kind of tough. It is perennial. Um, it lives a long time. It's virtually maintenance free. Um, it can survive in part shade, although it definitely does best in full sun. And um, it grows quite large in, in full sun. And um, it's very widely used in all sorts of Southeast Asian cooking. And it's, um, it's a fun one to learn how to cook with. And the smell is just absolutely wonderful. This is one of my favorites. I, um, I had this wonderful tea many years ago while I was traveling to different parts of the world and different parts of the world call it different things. Some parts of the world, the Spanish speaking world calls it te de Jamaica. Um, other parts of the world call it hibiscus tea or roselle tea, things like that. Um, it's um, a tea that is literally made from a part, um, a part of a, t a specific kind of hibiscus plant, um, the, the calyx, um, which is the, 
kind of this fleshy, um, fruity, flowery looking thing. Um, that is, um, it's actually not technically a flower and it's not quite a fruit. It is a, a really unique part of, a, of that plant, um, but it's, it's a little bit fleshy, it's tart, um, has a little bit of sweetness to it. And it is traditionally turned into tea, um, which is delicious. We've got someone else unmuted again. Um, and um, to other parts of the world will also use it as a replacement for cranberries. It has a similar sort of flavor. Um, it does require full sun. It can grow up to seven feet tall in one season. And it, and it just grows into this beautiful um, sprawling tangle. You can get a huge amount of, um, of the actual calyx harvested off of one plant. Uh, the, the leaves are also edible, which is none, another fun, um, fun side benefit to it. And it is hardy to about 40 degrees, which means that in the northern half of Florida, um, it, it will likely die in the winter unless you protect it. Um, but in the southern half of Florida, it should make it through the winter just fine. Cuban oregano is another one. This is a picture from our demo garden at our office in Sarasota County. Um, it's a really hardy perennial in South Florida, but it is frost sensitive. So um, in the Northern half of Florida, it won't overwinter unless you bring it inside or protect it um, really significantly outside. Um, you may know it by other names. Some of the other names it goes by are things like Mexican mint, Spanish thyme, Indian borage. There's a whole bunch of other names that it goes by. But it's, um, it's actually not related to oregano um, or thyme or borage. Um, it's related to basil. Um, so um, the leaves are maybe like the size, they're, the, the mature leaves are somewhere in the realm of like the size of like an egg. Um, they're a little bit fleshy. They're kind of juicy. They're very pungent. To me, it is like very, very pungent, strong oregano flavor. The plants are, are beautiful, really insect resistant, um, and the flavor is just amazing. They do fine in part shade. Um, they prefer sun, but they do just fine in part shade. And you only need to water them when they are very, very dry. Um, and actually the bed, the raised bed that this Cuban oregano is growing in at our office, um, we completely stopped watering it um, a year ago, actually exactly a year ago. And um, it has not gotten watered as far as I'm aware, other than what has fallen from the sky for a solid year. And, it's, and it looks great. And then this is um, this is another that I think is just so so worth encouraging folks to try. You know, if you if you moved here from a more northern place and always struggled with growing peppers, um, peppers love Florida. Peppers grow really really well in Florida. Um, the first time I grew a pepper in Florida, I was I had my socks knocked off. I had no idea that peppers could grow that robustly. Um, and um, I love growing all sorts of different kinds of peppers and turning them into some of the spices um, that sit on my, my pantry. Um, things like paprika. Paprika is actually um, a, a type of pepper. Um, so you can grow paprika peppers, dehydrate your own, um, your own peppers and grind them up in a spice mill and have your own paprika that you've, you've grown, grown and entirely made yourself. Um, you know, spices like Ancho. Ancho is actually just the, um, the dried um, version of, um, of roasted poblano peppers. Um, poblano, they're called poblano in their, in their fresh state, anchos in their, in their dried and powdered state. Um, they grow really, really well in Florida. Same with cayenne and so many other of the hot and sweet peppers. So that's a really fun way to make some of your own herbs or your own spices rather. And then there's so many others too, you know, so things like um, Coriander is actually the seed of cilantro. So you can let your cilantro actually go to seed, collect those seeds, and then you have your own coriander. There's so many creative ways that you can go about growing your own spice cabinet. And a lot of folks are space limited, right? You know, so rather than growing in the ground, um, you may be growing in pots. Um, most of the herbs that I talked about um, that are kind of like the standard American herbs grow quite well in containers. Um, a lot of the the herbs um, and spices that grow well in, in Florida, that, that last list that we just looked at, will do better um, in the ground or in a really large container because they tend to be really large, robust plants. Um, so just make sure that you're, you're picking the container that's the right size for the plant you're trying to grow. And one thing that I really love about growing herbs in, um, in containers is that they're movable. Um, you know, so as you're trying to figure out that perfect spot to grow, um, to grow an herb, you know, enough sun or not, you know, or too much sun or 
it's too wet or too windy or whatever, you can move it around until you find that spot that your, that your plants feel like they're actually happiest. And then there's certain plants like, like mint is the one that people most often grow that can actually turn into a, a weed if you don't keep it contained in a pot, um, and especially a pot propped up off the ground. And then just one quick, one more quick word about growing in a pot. Um, a lot of folks love the look of unglazed terracotta, me included. I love the look of unglazed terracotta pots. Um, just know that they grow out, they dry out extremely quickly, um, so quickly that they can become very stressful for your plants. Um, these are actually all basil plants that you see through here. This is what a very stressed, very dry basil looks like. Um, the sage actually looks like it's doing okay in that dry terracotta pot. And then this is um, over here, this is cilantro. This is very stressed, very dry cilantro that's producing flowers and therefore soon will be producing coriander seeds. So um, if, you are, if you are going with something like unglazed terracotta pots, just remember how quickly they dry out and you'll, you might want to think about putting a liner in that pot so that they don't dry out quite as fast. So that's what I've got for you today. Thank you all so very much for tuning in um, to talk about one of my personal favorite topics, which is herbs, herbs and spices and other flavorful things. 